Let's talk about OSHA or the Occupational Safe and Health Administration. I know many of you know them because either you love to cite their code in my comments and tell me everything I'm doing wrong, or you like to tell me how they're the bane of your existence. But I believe that we're only looking at a small piece of OSHA when we form that opinion of them. OSHA's mission statement is to assure the safe and healthful working conditions for working men and women by setting and enforcing standards and by providing training, outreach, education, and assistance. And I think we get stuck on that setting and enforcing standards as our definition of OSHA, but they have a lot of great programs. In fact, I'm gonna to go to some of their training soon so that I can come back and tell you more about what I've learned and how we can make our workplaces safer. Now, I have had the pleasure of escorting OSHA around at one of their random inspections of a medium-sized company. And also, unfortunately, I've been there when OSHA is investigating a workplace-related death, and I will share that with you as well. But first, let's talk a little bit about the history of OSHA. Because when I got researching, I was surprised to find that OSHA is not that old of an organization. OSHA was established by the U.S. Congress on December 29th, 1970, and at that time, we had 14,000 work-related deaths a year. Now, last year, we had 5,000 workplace-related deaths, so while that number is down, we still have a lot more work to do, and I do believe OSHA will play a very important part in us getting that number closer to zero. My first thought when I saw that they weren't established in 1970 was that we had no safety standard before that, but that isn't true. The Bureau of Labor Standards, which was part of the Department of Labor, was established in 1934. And yes, we definitely had a very unsafe workplace then. But from 1934 really to the establishment of OSHA, you did see a decline in workplace fatalities with the exception of wartime, and right in the end of the 60s, we started seeing a climb in workplace-related deaths. Now, let's talk a little bit about today's workplace. In 2022, there were 5,486 workplace fatalities. A worker died every 96 minutes. And by far, the transportation sector has the highest number of those fatal injuries with 2,066 or 37.7% of all occupational fatalities. Also up there are construction related accidents and protective service occupations. Now you can get all this information from the Bureau of Labor and Statistics, so I'm not gonna go through all of them, but two of them that were just really heartbreaking. One is that unintentional overdoses increased by 13.1% in 2022. That was 525 of those fatalities. And then really surprising to me is workers in the 55 to 64 age group continued to have the highest number of fatalities with 1,175 of them. And that still mainly is from transportation incidents, but behind that is falls, slips, and trips. And I guess I, I just think of that age group as having more experience. So that, that one just really shocked me. Now I have had the pleasure of escorting OSHA around during a random inspection at a medium company. And I'll have to say it really was eye-opening and gave me a different viewpoint of OSHA. And I'm going to go through their most frequently violated standards of what they cite most companies for. And really they line up with what I did see them talk about. Number one is fall protection. And yes, we need to take the time to tie ourselves off because even if we have had the greatest balance in the world, which I do not, or we are not scared of heights, which I am, all it takes is that one slight distraction and we can slip. Number two is hazard communication. Or mainly, do we know about the chemicals that are in our facility? 
And that is very important because at another company I worked at, we moved into a new building and there was a 55 gallon drum there with no label on it. So all of a sudden we have a mystery substance. So yeah, we need to know what the chemicals are, what the hazards are of them. And also hopefully we don't get an injury, but that way if someone ingests something or is exposed to something, we're not having to call the 1-800 number. We have that documentation available. Number three is ladders, and we did get cited a lot for ladders. We had to do a lot of climbing up onto material, and so a lot of our ladders had kinks in the runners. You know, the fiberglass had cuts in it, and you cannot have any of that. And back then, I really thought, well, that ladder still seems sturdy. It seems like a waste to throw it away, but that ladder was not designed to be kinked. And that's what you have to think about when you're thinking of these things. Okay, it probably is sturdy, but the manufacturer did not say that it is sturdy with three kinks in it. So if it has three kinks, it may not be sturdy. Respiratory protection. That is something I think our industry has gotten much better about in, even since I have been in it. Used to, maybe you had some exhaust fans, maybe you didn't. Dust was not that unusual. You go home at night, you blow your nose, it would always be black. And I go into plants now that I know used to or like that. And really, you can almost eat off the floor. So we have done a great job of that. But yeah, if there's any particulate in the air, it is not good for our lungs. And it is, especially after COVID, it's cool to have respirators and face masks and everything else on. So protect your lungs. Scaffolding, especially in the construction industry, we didn't have a lot of that at my plant, but I drive by construction workplaces a lot of time, especially residential ones. And you'll have someone one foot on a ladder, the other foot kind of grabbing hold of a piece of siding, and maybe they have a hammer in their hand. And I'm just like, yeah, that's just an accident waiting to happen. Get some scaffolding. It doesn't take that long to set up. And trust me, it takes a lot longer to recover from a broken leg or a broken arm or something when you do fall off of that ladder finally. Control of hazardous energy. I think this is one we still need to do more work on. We, we say lockout, tagout. I think we mostly think electrical lockout, tagout. I never forget the OSHA inspector came in and he's like, so Tim, <laughs> you know, and he was one of those more experienced inspectors, which yes, like every place, the different inspectors are different ways, but he's like, tell me about your lockout, tagout. And I was so proud. I'm like, yeah, you know, we got lockouts on everything and this and that and the other. And he said, I don't care about all that. Everybody locks out their electrical. How are you locking out your pneumatics? Well, I never even thought of doing that before. You got argon gas going, feeding all these machines. How are you locking out that argon gas? Uh, well, you know, never really thought about that either. Well, what about these ovens over here? So yeah, lock out, tag out means remove all of the hazardous energy, not just the electrical parts. Next was powered industrial trucks. And this was one that, you know, and here's where a good inspector can give you a whole different different view of OSHA. We were out in our yard where we moved material around with forklifts and he stopped me a second. He said, let's, let's just stand here a second. I want to wait until that forklift backs up. I want to hear if it's backup buzzer works. And while we we're waiting on it, he turned to me, he said, did you know that the number one way for a VDOT worker to get killed is getting ran over by a dump truck on their site? And that just shocked me. And sure enough, about that time, the forklift put it in reverse, backed up. There was no beeper. And there was the supervisor walking in the yard right behind it as he's doing it. So all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, man, that is important. Then we have eye and face protection. And, you know, here's one of those that really probably should be cited a lot more. Because, you know, if you go into a plant and OSHA's not around, although it's gotten better, so many people won't have their safety glasses on. And, you know... Everybody hears OSHA's coming, they throw their safety glasses on. But let's just not think about safety glasses is, you know, if we're using a chop saw or something, are safety glasses enough? You know, do we also need a face shield? So there's a lot of more protection than just the basic glasses. Make sure they're covering what you need. And the number 10 was one, I actually was just kind of surprised it was number 10 because it probably had the most resounding impact on me and my viewpoint of OSHA was machinery and machine guarding. 
Because I think when we think OSHA, you know, they want it like guarded to the point that the operator cannot have any contact with the machine. But that's one thing he explained to me was that not necessarily because, yeah, we had plenty of guarding issues. We got wrote up for plenty of guarding issues. But on one of the pieces of equipments, there was an opportunity for an operator, I mean, just vaguely to get their finger into this machine during normal operation. And so he's looking and he said, well, you know, if we put a guard right here and we do this, that would make it safer here. He's like, but that's going to cut the operator's view and that's going to turn them at this angle and then they're going to be able to put their whole hand in this machine. So no, we're going to leave this one just like it is. And that was just one of those surprising moments because I think we think OSHA is just like, no, we have to guard. No, they really want the operator to minimize their chance of hazards. Now, also I was involved in a workplace related death. And no, I will not share that with you. But I will share OSHA's attitude when they came in because it was not the attitude of a prosecutor coming in to find us guilty. They really did come in beside of us and really look at what exactly happened and figure out, hey, okay, what could we have done differently? What could that person have done differently? What could we change to minimize the chance that death happened again? Because in the end, it was a no-fault death. It was a series of unfortunate circumstances. Now, OSHA is broke up into regions, and they do have training available in every region. And I strongly urge you to at least have someone at your company go to some of their trainings, especially on those frequently violated standards, we'll say that you know that you're probably not in line with. We don't need to hide from OSHA. We do need to figure out how to comply because one final statistic, OSHA's workplace inspections have been shown to reduce injury rates and injury costs without adverse effects on employment, sales, credit ratings, or firm survival.